Hello everyone. Um, sorry for the sort of hiatus in uh, this video series, um, but today we are going to be talking about solvability. So the solvability of groups. Now, solvability is something that sometimes um, isn't covered or sometimes is like overlooked until you get to Galois theory. Um, and the reason I am covering it is because it is going to be relevant for Galois theory. Um, but I figure it's better to prove it or to go over it now because in the next video we're going to cover permutation groups and we're going to show that um, for permutation groups of a sufficient size, they're all um, not solvable. Okay, so what does a group being solvable mean? So a group G is uh, solvable if there exists, okay, I'm using shorthand notation, a sequence or uh, sometimes called a tower of normal subgroups uh, in such a way that uh, your first normal subgroup is like the whole group G. And then um, it is it is a nested sequence. So each um, each next subgroup is uh, normal in, in like it, you'll see so like h1 is normal in g and then h2 is normal in h1 and uh, notice that i think i mentioned this in a previous video that um, this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, h2 is normal in g uh, so i should just say just say subgroups um, and so this continues on until you get to the bottom of the tower is just the identity group, right? The trivial subgroup. Um, and there's a further condition that um, every, for any um, group subgroup in this chain or tower, um, if I quotient by the the normal subgroup contained in it, right? So the idea is that every everything in the tower has some normal subgroup, right? And so since you have a normal subgroup, you can take the quotient group, and this group has to be abelian for i equal to 0 through r minus 1, right? Where r is the stopping point. Okay, so all of the quotient groups that we can form are abelian. Okay, so this is like a really strange definition, and it doesn't really make sense until you get to Galois theory, where you actually use it. But regardless, we're still going to uh, prove some some preliminary results that will be used later on. So let for our first result, let K be a subgroup of G, and let's suppose that um, that can't I <laughs> can't write today. Uh, let's suppose that K and G mod K, right? So the quotient group formed by G and K are solvable. Then G is solvable. So the idea is saying that um, if you have some group and you have you you essentially have these two um, two like smaller solvable groups that are kind of composing G and uh, the the result says that G itself is solvable and um, so let we're just going to denote um, G bar. Uh, we're just going to let this be g by k, okay? So we have some tower 
uh, h0 bar um, is normal, and then this goes down to h, uh, have it denoted hm here, hm bar, and this is, of course, um, the identity. Now this, remember, like this identity element in g mod k is really representing all of k uh, in, in g. Um, and that's going to be important. And let um, let f be um, so a let f be the um, natural projection. So um, the the canonical homomorphism with kernel uh, k, right? So this is mapping. Um, essentially, this is mapping every element to its corresponding coset. G. It's mapping G to GK, essentially. Um, and then let, for each I equal to 0 through M, we're going to let uh, H sub I equal the inverse image of each of these um, of each of these subgroups in the tower of G bar. So the idea is that these H sub I are going to uh, comprise a um, a tower for G. It's not going to be all of the tower, right? Because think about what is F bar, uh, F inverse of H M bar, right? So in other words, what is the inverse image of this identity in G mod K? Well, like I said. The identity in G mod K corresponds to um, all all of K, right? All of K gets sent to um, the um, sorry, I'm like out of it today. Uh, it gets sent to the coset like K times K, right? And that's just K. So all of it is being sent to the identity, and precisely those are the only elements that are getting sent to the identity. So f inverse of h bar m, uh, or h m bar, is going to be k itself. And that's where we're going to use the fact that k is solvable. OK? So uh, so h0, right, which is the inverse image of h0 bar, is g, right? Because since g, this natural projection, right, projection maps, typically in mathematics, are surjective. Right, and certainly that's the case because every g is being mapped to some coset g sub k, uh, g times k, and uh, this is um, surjective. Okay, and h m, which is the inverse image of h m bar, is k as previously mentioned. Um, by an isomorphism theorem that uh, I talked about in the last two videos. We have that h sub i mod h sub i plus 1 is isomorphic to h sub i bar minus uh, quotient h sub i plus 1 bar. So these groups are abelian, right? Because if you're isomorphic to an abelian group, then you're abelian. Um, thus, we have a partial tower, right? Starting with H0, going down to Hm, which is equal to K. Then, using a tower for k, since we know k is solvable, we get a tower for g. Okay, so that proves that g is solvable. Okay. Um, all right, let's look at another um, result. If G is solvable, 
than um, any subgroup. Uh, and I think I'm kind of rambled about this in another video that I'm using this notation to indicate that something is a subgroup, right? So a subset with a little g. Uh, any subset of g is solvable. Okay. And the proof of this goes as follows. So if we have some tower for g, then we consider the tower for h that looks like this. Um, so let us first justify that, um, that h sub h bar, or h, h intersect h0 is equal to h. Well, that's true because, um, g is h0, so this is h intersect g, and g contains h, so, um, h intersect g is just going to be h. Uh, h intersect hr, well, hr is just the identity, and, um, since H is a group, right, is a subgroup of G, since it's a group, it must contain the identity, so the intersection will be the identity. Um, now, now, notice that we have H intersect H sub I, right, which is one of these groups, intersect H sub I plus 1 is just equal to, um, h intersect h sub i plus 1, and this is a simple um, set argument, right? Um, so by, uh, I guess we should argue that, um, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have erased that. Um, we should argue that these are actually normal, normal subgroups, right? And this just follows from the fact that, um, okay, so like we know h sub i being, or sorry, h sub i plus one being normal in h sub i means if I take any element of h sub i, then if I conjugate h sub i plus 1, I'm going to get h sub i plus 1 again. So if I take um, an element of h intersect h sub i, then that's also an element of h sub i. And so therefore, if I conjugate with, if I conjugate an element of h sub i plus 1, then I'll still get an element of h sub i plus 1. Furthermore, since um, since I'm also choosing from H, uh, and I also chose from H here, then the conjugate will be a product of three elements in H, and therefore it will also be an H. Um, so, um, by looking at the conjugacy relationship. Um, thus we can take quotients and by, by an isomorphism theorem, we have um, h intersect h sub i uh, mod h intersect h sub i plus 1. This is going to be isomorphic to, um, since this bottom here, uh, we can write it like this, and then, um, and then we apply a isomorphism theorem that will transform this to look like this. Um, and this will be quotiented by h sub i plus 1. 
and uh, this expression is a subgroup of h sub i mod h sub i plus 1. Why? Uh, because any element in here, um, well, we know elements of h sub i plus 1 are elements of h sub i, and um, so are elements of h intersect h sub i. So all of these elements are going to be in h sub i. So this is contained in h sub i mod h sub i plus 1, which is abelian. And we know that abelian subgroups, or sorry, subgroups of abelian groups are abelian. So we have that each of the quotient groups are abelian, and so we are done. We have a tower for h, so h is solvable. Okay. So hopefully by now you're getting used to the idea of how these sort of proofs go. Um, so first we need a small little lemma that I don't think I mentioned. And that is if G is abelian and F from G to some other group G prime is surjective morphism, or I think I was abbreviating it by home, um, then G prime is abelian. Okay, so for the proof, um, let x and y be elements of G prime. We can write x equal to f of a and y equal to f of b since f is surjective, right? Uh, any element of G prime can be written as an image of F. Um, okay. Thus, X, Y, which is equal to F of A, F of B, is equal to F of A, B. And now, since G is abelian, we can swap um, the elements A and B. And then we use the property of the homomorphism once more. And this is equal to yx. Um, so any two elements of g prime commute, and therefore g is abelian. Okay, so short lemma. Um, and now we're going to prove a similar result. Um, let me line this, which says that if if g is solvable and um, and f from g to g prime is a surjective homomorphism, then g prime is solvable. Okay. So let's take a look at the proof. And this proof is going to be quite long, um, but the idea is somewhat similar. So since we know G is abelian, we can start by uh, writing a, um, a tower for G, right? Um, as usual. And, okay. Uh, now let um, H sub I prime, oops. Uh, h sub i prime be the images of the h sub i. Um, clearly, um, h sub 0 prime, which is f of g, is equal to g prime by, uh, since it's surjective, right? The image, the definition of surjective means that uh, if I take the image of g, I'm going to get g prime. And f of um, h prime of r, which is f of the identity. Of course, the identity is always mapped to um, the identity in a homomorphism, so, um, so we have these two relations, right? Um, so now let y be in h sub i plus 1 prime, 
So, um, and let y equal f of a. Uh, with a in h sub i plus 1. Um, well, since since h, plus, since h sub i plus 1 is contained in h sub i, um, it's contained in h sub i, um, a is in h sub i, and y is in h sub i prime. Thus, um, h sub i plus 1 prime is a subgroup of h sub i prime. Okay. Now we just need to show that it is a normal subgroup, right? Um, if x equals f of b is chosen in h sub i prime, right? So b, where b is in h sub i, then um, we need to check that x, y, x inverse, right? The conjugate. We need to show that this is in um, h sub i plus 1 prime, okay? So we can write this using um, properties of the homomorphism. So we get f of b, a, b inverse. And um, since h sub i plus 1 is normal in h sub i, b, a, b inverse is an element of h sub i plus 1. So f of b, a, b inverse is an element of h sub i plus 1 prime, right? So that shows that uh, thus we have normalcy, OK? Um, OK. Now we just need to show that the quotient groups that we form are abelian. And to do that, we are going to construct a, a map from one quotient group to another and then employ our, uh, our lemma. OK, right? So our goal here is to show that this will be a surjective homomorphism. And then since we know these quotient groups are abelian, uh, that will tell us that these quotient groups are abelian. Okay. Um, and we are going to define this by uh, letting h times h by plus 1, right? So this is a uh, an element of this quotient group. It is a coset of h by plus 1, where h is an h sub i. And uh, this is going to be equal to the coset of um, h sub i plus 1 prime uh, times f of h. Okay. So first we need to check that this is well defined. So um, if h1 h sub i plus 1 equals h2 h sub i plus 1, then um, Uh, then h1, h2 inverse is in h sub i plus 1. So f of h1, f of h2 inverse is in h i plus 1 prime. So um, f of h1 h i plus 1 prime is equal to f of h2 h sub i plus 1 prime. Okay. Again, we have to check that whenever we define a function or, you know, of a map from a quotient group and we define it on the cosets, we have to make sure that 
our um, definition does not depend on the representative that we choose, right? So here our formula explicitly uses H, but we have to show if the if two different H's give the same coset, then uh, the outcome gives gives also gives the same thing, okay? And that's what we've shown here. Um, okay, so this is a homomorphism because uh, ch -ch -ch. okay so if I multiply two cosets inside okay then I can just multiply the representatives and look at that coset okay and then I can apply uh, the the definition, and then I can apply the fact that this is a homomorphism, F, right, is our homomorphism, and um, this is H, this is primed, and so this is going to be F of H1, H sub i plus 1 prime, times F of H2, H sub i plus 1 prime, and this is, this shows that this is an isomorphism. Okay, now we just have to show it is surjective. So if h prime, h i plus one prime is an element of this quotient group, um, then since h prime is in h sub i prime, h prime is equal to f of h for some um, h in h i and uh, our map v of h i plus 1 will map this to h prime h sub i plus 1 prime. So is surjective. Thus, h sub i prime mod h sub i plus 1 prime is abelian by the lemma. And that concludes the theorem, right? So we have constructed from our tower on G we've constructed a, um, a tower on G prime. And that shows that it is solvable. So these are just some basic results on solvable groups. Again, this definition really is um, very abstract on face value. And it will only make sense in the context of, um, of Galois theory. And it will show that um, the famous result that um, there is no general formula for the roots of a polynomial of degree five or higher, right? And for that, we have to show that um, permutation groups of sufficient order, in particular of order, um, you know, well, the order of the groups will be five factorial or higher, but, you know, S5 and so on, these groups are not solvable. And we will do that in the next video.